Well, what's the crack, everybody? How are you getting on? You are all very welcome to episode 163 of Ramble Pod. Uh, it is the 13th. The 13th. Friday the 13th. Whatever. I've, I mean, come on. Come on. What are we going to do? Friday the 13th, uh, 2020. November. See the way I did that? All back to front, not over the shop. Literally, it's gone that way. I was found myself writing full words last night on a script. My eyes were turned inside out, writing the full words back to front. I couldn't do that if you tried. But they were actually perfectly back to front. That's where we're at now, lads. That's where we're at. My apologies, I should have had a ramble pot out to you, but that was the reason why I was updating the script. I'm doing a very, very fun, exciting thing for the, the Laughter Lounge next week. And there needed to be changes back and forth. I had to dissect it, pull it apart. It's been a while since I've done anything like this, so I had to make sure it was going to be fucking funny. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think it is. It's going to be a bit of crack. I can't show any of it to you. Nope, it's under lock and key until their customers basically see it. That's that's fair enough. That's just the way it is. But I will. I'll show it to the Patreons first when I do get my hands on it. Um, it's yeah, it's a funny, funny, silly, silly thing that's going to be filmed incredibly. Holy shit. We had a Zoom call today about what they're, the setup they're going to do inside their forest. There's a bunch of comedians going in. We're doing just different things from stand up to sketch to. And they've just set the place up like the most ludicrous high tech studio you've ever seen. It's like, holy shit. There's nobody. I would wager. I'd wager. I'd know most of the major comedy clubs around the place. You, you know, you follow them and stuff like that, and they're pumping out everything they could put out. There's nobody doing anything but like what they're about to do. Cool, very, very, very cool. It's going to be exclusive for customers and all the rest. But like I said, the patrons will get the first look. Ah, there you are. So I wouldn't mind a fucking loads to be talking about, but stuff has been taken up with that and trying to trying to prep for the December possibility of possibly a bit of work coming in. Who knows? But that's the crack. I will. I'll get one out. I maybe get, might get one out Sunday evening or something weird like that just for the crack. See, can I slip in one just to get ahead of myself and all the rest of it. But we, um, yeah, like I said, the Patreons. I, to this episode, if you are listening, thank you very much. A couple of new Patreons this week. Jonathan, Seamus, Oli, you're most likely right now not going to hear this. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Because I put the full video of today's interview actually up on the Patreon page earlier today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting ahead of myself, lad. So all the interview, well, a shitload anyway, since I started properly using Zoom and everything else, a shitload of them are up there on the Patreon page. So if you want to just go back and watch it for the crack instead of just listen to the audio, there's probably a little bit more in there too, you know what I mean? Because in the audio, you got to trim it down. You can't be having any long, elongated, <sighs> I see what you mean. You know, you can't have that. you got to nip that down, tidy it up and all the rest of it. So... You know, it's up to yourself. It's over there. It supports the podcast. You get the ad-free audio versions too, if all you want to do is listen to it in your ear holes. That's for ye. You get the ads, because if the ads have given you a dose, you know what to do. Hop over. Hop on over. Little as three doll hairs a month, apparently. I think that's what it is. I, I, can't be sh- I can make head nor fucking tail of this thing. I don't know. <laughs> I've said it at the minimum from that they allowed me day one. And... But some people decide, fuck it, I'm giving a few more pound. There's a few people in there giving uh, 12 quid. And that's a fair play to you. Sound out. You don't have to. But sound out. That's what you do. More people have bought merch this week. And nobody's sending me no pictures. I don't know, is it this embarrassment level? <laughs> or this crowd hasn't fucking sent them to you yet. I don't know. But people, there was two hoodies went this week and somebody bought a face mask with my fucking logo on it. I have to see this. I have to see it. Yeah, you gotta send it to me. Just tag me on Instagram. I gotta see. And do it out in public too. You're walking down the street. Do a fucking video. Tag me in the video of you walking down the street. As people look at my angry head looking back at them. Mmm. Oh, Jesus Christ. So both those links are down in the show notes. Anyway, if you wanna, if you wanna jump on board, go ahead. Why not? Um, yeah, I was... <laughs> There's other stuff too If you're brand new to the podcast Fair play to you Thanks very much As you recognise This is number 163 A few people have jumped over 
got a good old blast new new people on board, a few patrons even as a result of those Conspiracy Guys podcasts from a couple of weeks ago. And people are like, ah, this fucker's mad. Let's go. And uh, <laughs> like a few a few people have actually written kind of similar things if I said, yeah, I so I listened to about nine episodes and I like it. I'm like, oh, how? Jesus. I, I like that I didn't, I, I wasn't a pushover for you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We're at number seven here. I'll keep going. See what way we are. So I'm happy. Whatever. As you see, there's a ton more. There's ramble pods there. If you like my fucking rambling, if you want to go onto the YouTube page, which um, you know, it's got a ton of stuff up there, like the Bookshot Side Show. It's got uh, all the hard enough podcasts are up there as well. The way the videos. There's yeah. There's a gang of stuff up there. I I know. I'm a YouTuber now. Did I ever tell you about that tonight? I was walking back from a gig. Early, it was an early gig, got in, did the show or whatever. Show was over by like nine o'clock. And I remember I was walking up by the Shelburne in Dublin and coming out of a coffee shop with like these kids. You could only describe them as kids, like 15, 16. A bit late now to be out on a Friday night in Dublin. If I don't mind saying so myself. But one of them, whatever the fuck he recognised me from, I have no idea. Like of all the things, he went, that guy's a YouTuber. And I looked around to see who they were talking about, and all four of these lads were looking at me. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a YouTuber because I have a YouTube page, lads. Almost, there are goat herders in Afghanistan have YouTube pages, lads. You can have one too. You don't just have to take fucking videos of your computers, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, there you go. That was my recognition of claim to fame with the youth of today. Huh? The excitement of it. The wild mountain time. But also long fit and big top of the morning to everybody's fucking bullin' over that, aren't they? Yeah. They're bullin'. The accents. Horrendous. Hor- like, I don't know where the surprise is. Why people are bullin' over the accents. Has anybody looked at the actual clip? It looks like a parody of... What was Find a Ned or something? Up and down the mountain. Do you know, it's like... The, or The Quiet Man. It it looks like a complete rip-off from like an early 90s diddly-diddly Welsh slash fucking Irish. I have a man went up a hill and came down a fucking fish. You know, it was... And you, you've they got all these unbelievable actors they could have used. And they used people... Even Jamie Dornan. Well, I know he's not from Northern Ireland or he's not from the South where he's portraying the accent. So his accent just sounds shocking. You know, it's all... Like... Kate Blanchett, I'm saying it right, apparently. Kate Blanchett, she did a good accent when she played uh, Veronica Gearn. John Voight, fucking what's her name's father, he did a good Kerry accent, a decent enough Kerry accent when he played a copper in the general. So it can be done, like. But what, like, you tell me you couldn't have rang up somebody. You couldn't have rang up a couple of Irish actors and gotten them to do it. You know? Jamie Dornan. Like John Hamm, you want Emily fucking fucking marijuana blunt and Christopher Walken, all supposed to be Irish rural people. From it's it's essentially like Wake and Ned is what I, is all I can tell from the fucking thing. Diddly diddly diddly, funny music while people are driving cars between two points. Hmm, there's a dilemma. You know, there's a love interest. I'm a schmilly old fella from the country. You're six foot four, fucking Greek god, you bastard, you. You know, nobody's buying it. But it'll go gangbusters in the States. Just like PS, I piss all over you, or whatever it is called. It'll go gangbusters. They'll make a fucking fortune of it, just purely because of the names. It'll be fine. And they'll all come out with their silly apologies on the late late in a year's time. Christopher Hawkins never done the late late. Not a fucking prayer. Anyway, I have talked enough shit. You know the crack. Follow me on all the usual platforms. Blah, 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 blah. Look in the show notes to support the show. I don't want to be withering the ears off. You're moving on to today's guest. This man is a whale in poker terms, in fucking casino terms, uh, comedy terms. I've been trying to go after this guy for so long. We, I fanboyed a little bit on this one. I won't lie. I won't lie. I definitely did. It was that exciting to get Pat Short on the podcast, knowing from what I've been told, how sound of a bloke he was. All the fucking stuff he's done throughout the years when it comes to comedy. My 
Jesus. And never takes the foot off the pedal. And has deviated from doing, you know, a two-hander to one-hander to characters live on fucking shows. You know what I mean? You walk out on the late, late. The audience are fucking prunes. You know what I mean? They're absolutely inverted in crack. And he comes out and rips, you know, rips every fucking time. And then turns around and fucking smashes it on TV, smashes it in fucking straight dramas, films, and smashes it on stage in West End and Broadway. Like, what the f- And just goes, Error. you know, you'll have that. Fuck. And he's from Tip. Most importantly. <laughs> Sit back and enjoy the great and truly powerful Pat Short. Pat Short, Perfect. how are you keeping? Are you well? I'm, I'm great, Tom. Thank you very much. <laughs> my my missus was saying to me as I was going up the stairs to to the office, the corner of the fucking upstairs. <laughs> you know, we all we've all invented an office nowadays. Like a fancy palace behind <laughs> you. <there. laughs> Literally, it was now a green wall yesterday, and I said, "Jesus, I have to do something with that." <laughs> <laughs> and honest to God, I have three, three or four pallets out the back. So I'm just going to split great. them. Yeah, it looks brilliant. It's, I, I, do you know what? Lockdown has done that to me. We, other people just banana bread. I went mad on pallets. I made a load it's, of stuff out of it. Come here to me. There's fellas in the, in, the, in the city gallery here selling pallets like that for big money. <laughs> <laughs> you could be onto something, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> pallets by Tom. Jesus Christ. I don't, you'd want to, yeah, you'd want to be like, but her, her one, she goes, I guarantee you will come down. You'll have the strongest tip accent again when you go. Because yeah. if I'm two minutes on the phone to the outlet, she'll, oh, she'll, have, she'll have known. I've been on to the old fella. She went, <laughs> well, how's Bill keeping? I went, ha, how would you know? Because all of a sudden you're going, well, how was it going? Well, how was things? Well, how was things? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I used to get that when I used to come down to Limerick first. Yeah, I, you know, as a young fella, I'd be like, well, and they all go, well. water. And I was like, what? What's the water thing? And they all roared and laughing, thinking it's funny. It's a, it is a real temporary thing, isn't it? It's well. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because even even my grandfather to this day, and he's 99 years of age, he's originally from Bally Landers in, in uh, no, Limerick, yeah, Limerick. But they wouldn't say well. And when he moved into Tip, into Bansha, and he bought a farm there, he couldn't for the first 20 years, even still to this day, he turned around and go, I don't get the well thing. He's just, <laughs> it doesn't say, I said, you're only from 15 miles back the road originally. Jeez, <laughs> relax with you. Like, <laughs> but it may be another planet. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Do you know, but does, but I, I I don't know. Are you of the the ilk? I had Dennis Leamy on the podcast one day, and he I said it. I put it to him. I says, "Is it? Do you reckon? Because people do say that tip people are mad. Do you?" And he went. I said, "Do you know what? When I joined Monster first, he says I thought they were being racist towards me or something. He says, "Do you know what they were saying? Tip fellas are mad." And then I started to look around. I went. Or maybe oh, listen, he, no, he was playing with Alan Quinlan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quinny's completely mad. <laughs> mental, mental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, but I suppose there is a kind of a like there's a spark of madness. I I know Nicky English and a few more. Like, mm. Nicky be fairly mad. Joe Hayes character. You know what I mean? Absolute character. Um, there is a kind of a there is a bit of madness there. All right, a bit of crack, spark or something. Yeah. There? Because I put it, Paul Collins backed it up. He went, no, no, absolutely. So, He's yeah. mad as well. Yeah, there, there we, <laughs> now, have we just answered the, answered the question there? Like, <laughs> And where's Collins from? Is he South Tip? South Tip. South he? Tip. He's, he's not Bally Bait, no, that's Brendan Cummins. Uh, God, where's he from? They had a pub anyway. This is, I yeah. Just, yeah. can't remember, but he, like, again. Gas man, he, yeah. Yeah, stone cracked again, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. But and even I, I put this, I remember I was gigging in Edinburgh one time and I just popped in to catch the end of a monster match at, in a pub after the gig. And there was a Monaghan fellow sitting at the bar. He says, hey, hey, I says, oh, hello. He says, hey, is that Tipperary? And I says, it is Tipperary, yeah, yeah. God, you're mad. Some of them are, some of them are. I, I, I wouldn't consider myself that mad. <laughs> No, but in fairness, but like it would, it kind of leads into, I suppose, the, like where did comedy, like what was the comedy? Was it a savage crack house at home? Because comedy is kind of a, a currency, isn't it? Like in a lot of places, you know? Yeah, I mean, I would have always considered lots of other fellas in school funnier than me, uh, people at home funnier than me. You know, I, I always maintain I got into comedy with John Kenny uh, and almost learned it as a craft, if you understand what I'm oh, saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of way. Okay, I would have a... I would have a way of looking at things that would make it a bit kind of... I was all cynical, I suppose, which is a good trait for a comedian. Yeah. 
you know, you're looking at it different. You're having to crack. You're always looking for the fun and something and not take things too seriously. But then what I learned from being on the road is turning that into the craft of stagecraft, as you, for the want of a better word. And, and then being able to get across that, that humour on a stage to people, you know, which is very different. I mean, look, you know as well as I do, anyone will tell you about Ireland. You go into any pub, you'll hear a fella telling a story or, yeah. Yeah, or a cat and, a cat, and it's, you'll just piss yourself laughing. It's hilarious. Yeah. But can that guy get up on the stage and do it is a different thing altogether. And that's where the difference is between you and me and, and people like that, you know. So you kind of always think, gosh, there's someone, there's a load of lads funnier than me out there. And there is. But what we do is a different thing. Yeah, you can package it up and put it out the right way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. yeah. And can you can you keep it fresh every night for a new audience? Like it's brand new That's for it. them, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the that is the big thing. I mean, I remember people saying to me, you know, you do sketch comedy and stuff, but stand ups guys, they're like, Jesus, it's it's like it comes out of their head every night. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, had a lot I hate of to tell you, folks. I hate to exactly <laughs> to shatter that illusion. <laughs> I think I, they, they always say that about Eddie Izzard. He's the one comedian that really does, uh, is very, very inventive and, and does come up with stuff off the top of his head. Yeah. Lot. But he's, it's very, very, very rare. It's very, I, I don't know if there's too many more than him. No, and even the likes of Dylan Moran, too, was, I remember being put, and I put it, oh, chatted with Dylan Moran one time. He goes, God, yeah. no. God, no. God, oh, yeah, 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 you yeah. couldn't. He said, you couldn't. You couldn't. No, you're no. doing a run in Edinburgh in 30 nights, like or whatever you're going. Jesus Christ Almighty, you'd have a mental breakdown midway. Like, if you're trying, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's true. No, but look, that's that's the whole thing: telling stories and, and uh, stand-up comedy and comedy in general. It's just that's why this kind of you know the, the, I, you know the current climate we're in at the moment, and there's a government grant to help out, and some people are saying streaming. You know, you just stream the shows, and you're saying for comedy that doesn't work. Oh no, 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 it just does not. You no. cannot do it. You know, and I, I, I would imagine it's difficult enough for musicians, but everyone, you'd, you'd, it's like listening to an album over and over again. If you got your favorite tunes, you, you can do that, not a yeah. bother. But you wouldn't sit down and listen to the same gags or oh, watch Lord. it over and over and over, not a chance of it. So that's kind of creating a bit of a problem for us. And the other thing, too, too much. So like, I, I put a podcast together early this year. Yeah. And this is all sketches. And it's difficult to come up with new material oh my and God. write a whole block of it. Now, I'm working on series two at the moment. And people are contacting saying, you know, you only did six episodes. So you do it. And I was like, Jesus, that's <laughs> the work to put that together and the yeah. characters and all that. So uh, it's, it'll probably be a bit easier putting the second, second, second series together in some respects. But it's a huge volume of work coming up with it. You know? Gee, I mean, how do you, I, I will, I mean, the, right now with the lockdown, never book, the, the time, like you seem to be just... Jesus, you seem to be like Joe Rogan or something. You've about, you seem to have about seventeen well, balls in the air. Well, I do, and I, I and I, it's 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 exciting and it's great. But it's yeah. like you're planning for the years on. You know, I'm working on a new live show at the moment. I'm working on the podcast stuff. Uh, I was doing some auditions yesterday for some films and stuff, which are coming up in the new year. I, I do have two films coming up in the new year. I have the scripts for them. Working closely with the director on one of them, uh, and I just finished a, a TV series for Amazon. And uh, uh, Channel Four, which we just finished in Belfast, there recently. So, uh, comedy series. So there's there's a lot going on, which is which is great. Yeah. But it, it, yeah, you've got to try and manage your time. And and people think in the lockdown you're doing nothing, you know. Oh. You know, but it's it's not like that, you know. Well, you have to change spec too, because it's not like you can go out and have a look at the thing or talk to a fella or sit down normally. Like it's everything has changed. Like hasn't it? So you go right now. Now I've got to channel my time really really well now at this stage like yeah you end up being a busy fool you know that's yeah yeah perfect phrase yeah yeah and it, and you just end up doing loads of work and stuff uh you know f- for absolutely nothing and that's what really put <laughs> me at the start of this thing i got contacted by a good few charities and stuff one charity said to me sure look there's, sure, there's a lot of content makers out there doing nothing they'd surely be delighted to do something and you're going <laughs> <laughs> did you really say that <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, like to be doing something. Yeah. You know, anyway, that's another argument. I won't get stuck in that. <laughs> no, but the, the, I mean, the whole the, the, the comedy thing was like you, when you look through back through your body of work. My good Jesus, you've some <laughs> amount done. But there's all there was at no point like everybody ebbs and flows nearly in the as a national treasure or whatever to go. On. But anybody you've ever talked to has always loved Pat Short, and I think it's oh. something to do with the fact that you there seems to be a genuine era. 
I, you know, you you never get wanky about it for the want of a better phrase. Like, even though you're doing these epic things, you seem to normalize it for people in interviews going, are she, you know, in uh, Broadway? They're like, what? Stop one second. What? You know? But it's work. You know, I mean, it, it, it is. I remember doing Broadway. You mentioned it there. And uh, we were the most nominated show for the Tony Awards. And, Stop. Uh, yeah, we were working with Daniel Rattler. So we're all being interviewed and on the run up to the Tonys. And uh, this was like, Parties were being invited to with serious heads and stuff in New York, rooftop parties and cameras. And I was out doing interviews with all sorts of CNNs and everything else on the street outside the theater because we were the most nominated. Not because they knew who I was, but anyway, that uh, so on and so forth. And then once the awards are over, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Trudging down to the theater every night, the kind of crack went out. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was a bloody job. And then I had like three months to go before I went home after this and there was no more parties, no more invited to anything. Uh, we didn't win a Tony. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly you're going, oh, Jesus, I want to go home now. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you put this at the end, you fuckers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're three months ahead of you. Um, like we had Clint, East- Clint Eastwood <laughs> introducing us and stuff like that. Do you know, it, it was like huge. And we all had tickets to the Tonys, which are like gold, like, and everybody who's anybody was at it. Um, so it was... It was a huge excitement and everything, but I do remember that bump the next day all over trudging in. And it, then it is work. I mean, you have to really, it, it, it was in, intensive, eight shows a week, you know. Lord. Yeah, really hard going. Your day off was literally throw yourself down and try and recover after the week. And off you went again, you know. So it was, it was, it was hard going. I mean, have- we... You'd have to look after yourself during something like that too, though, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were we were doing a play. Um, I can only imagine what it's like for the dancers and in the musicals. Like, Jesus, that's physical. I don't know. How, like, I was... don't know how they do it. I mean, I found it tough. I found it very. I was asked, would I do a? I was asked to offer the contract of a year to come back out and do another Broadway show, and I just don't know. No, no. <laughs> I take me chances at home. In <laughs> You're grand. I'll start a podcast, lads. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I knew a fellow, he was a dancer with cats. He was on oh. cats and jizz. I mean, he was a specimen of him. You know what I mean? He was in yeah. unbelievable nick. He looked nearly like a, you know, a, a rugby flank or whatever. You know, he just was a bit like a god, this lad. <laughs> and this will tell you my naivety. I'm sure I'd never been in it. I'd done a bit, a little bit to tell you, a little, but I'd never been in it. And I remember sitting beside him one day and I was looking at the size of his calves. I went, Jesus Christ, John, you've some size. And he's originally from from Limerick, and I never saw him out of character because he was playing Beast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, Jesus, you must have played a bit of rugby or hurling back in the day or something with you. And I swear to God, he says, Jesus, no chicken. Sure, it's all the dancing. And just went back to like, really... <laughs> I don't know what way to look. I felt like such, such a knob. <laughs> you know? but, oh, the dancers but, are as fit. Unbelievable. But, but minding him, like he, he was in his 30s now and no. every evening he'd, he'd actually be giving the legs a rub down and for his voice he'd defaced That's over the funny. steam and yolk and oh Lord yeah. save us. He was like an athlete like. Yeah. Oh, well they are. They are. There's no question of it, you know. But you want you want to be cut out for it. Yeah. Did, did I freeze up there for a second? You did. You did, Tom, but you look lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, you look very pen- deep and taut. <laughs> that has never happened to me. Anytime I've ever frozen before, I'm always like a, about to have a stroke or something. Just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I, I but even talk with people that you would come from the most random places. Like I did a TV show years ago called Damo and Ivor, and that would not have come about only for Pat Short. It was so oh random boy. yeah Andy Andy that wrote it he says I wouldn't have even conceived because his father's originally from now Andy's from Fox Rock you know he lives the the D4 lifestyle right. but his father is from Two Mile Boroughs originally and may as well That's still right. be still be from Two Mile Boroughs but he said it's all that but he could do every line you would ever put out there ever and he went only for the character <laughs> just I the characters Andy, yeah he's great he's lovely yeah yeah He's a great guy. He's a great guy himself. I, I love Damon Ivar. It's a great show. Um, he, I mean, he does he does the characters so so well. It's brilliant. But it's funny. I met him all right, and he he's heavily influenced by obviously where his dad is from, you know, which is great. And how well he can do the accent as well. There's times when he's like, "Hi," and you're going, "Jesus Christ Almighty!" You know, it is he <laughs> he nails it like you know. <laughs> yeah. 
But I, I, because yeah, it must I, be good fun. Oh Lord, say like it was again. I was I was so naive to it. I just showed up and they went right. Everything is, de-. and I didn't realize because there was good money put into this. I thought, went, well, this must be the way everything is filmed, is it, lads? I said, no, <laughs> no, this is not how it's done all the time. <laughs> Rick Mail doesn't just walk around the corner smoking a fag gun. Hello, darling. You're like, oh, how are you, Rick? You know, just as cool, you know. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was it was really really fast. They had to get it done very very quickly. So it it didn't it didn't have any of those lethargic moments. You know, there was no sitting down hardly at all. Like, yeah, it was yeah. just felt like yeah. one long sketch. It was just rapid the way it turned turned yeah. around. You know what I mean? So it was it was it was right good crack making that, especially the fact that I played a D four wanker in it. Basically, you know, so and the dis- <laughs> the disappointment when you meet people then who are actually from Dublin four and they go, "Are you not?" Uh, in it? And you go, "No, I'm from Tipperary." Sorry, you know, and just near- <laughs> tell me about the the straight because this nearly interests me not more but just fucking fascinates me is that you went from being this you know you've done iconic amounts of comedy throughout Ireland and then you pop up showing in straight roles. Was that something you went after or did somebody put it to you? Did Mar- you know? Well, it's something I always had an interest in doing. Uh, just, I, you know, obviously, I hadn't gotten any auditions or calls. I'd done one film early on, which was straight, straight enough role, actually. It was um, Angela Mooney Dies Again. It was mm. Mia Farrow, myself, and Brendan Leeson and Patrick Bergen. That, and that was years ago. Um uh, but not, yeah, it, what happened with the with Garage, I suppose, was the big straight road one for me. And I had worked with Lenny Abramson on a few projects before, and uh, we we knew each other. And he always had me in mind for that role, and it was a very very serious role, beautifully written by Mark O'Halloran, um, who's won IFTAs for many of his films and, and, and projects, you know. Uh, and they'd done Adam and Paul prior to me doing that, so I was well conscious of what they were able what they were about yeah and and uh adam and paul was just an incredible film so i oh. thought jeez you know if if they're doing stuff like that it's you're in good hands so I, I i i was delighted to be part of it and then it became the film it is that everyone knows about now it's a huge success became the biggest art house film in the world that year and we were in Cannes with it and all over the world so yeah. it was great and, me. and after that, then I got like John Borman asked me to do a film with him and various other people. So I got, I got, I was lucky then I got to work with some amazing directors after that, you know. And that's class then, because then you're able to straddle both sides of the fence. So you can pop back over whenever you want, like. Yeah, yeah. And I, and, and I got to, you know, I, I'd already worked with Martin McDonough prior to that, but got to work on stage with him and got to work with his brother John then on, uh, on Guard and, and Calvary as well. So John Michael McDonough. So, yeah, it, it was amazing. Yeah, it opened doors for me. Uh, directors looking at me in in, in America and, and uh, London, you know, so which is great. It's the success of Killing a Scully, like as well, then you can step back over to Killing a Scully. Because it was, did you say, did you know, obviously, and did you go, will I slightly abbreviate Kill a Scully? Or is that just me thinking? No, what happened was we filmed in the town of Kill, Kill a Scully. All right, okay. And in the village of Kill O'Scully, we filmed. And we wanted to call the show <laughs> Kill O'Scully. But the legal people in RT were afraid if we did that, people might think we were plagiarizing them or somebody, and it could be legal issues down the road. So we called it Kill O'Scully. Yeah, you don't want that Borat issue, you know, where he's getting sued <laughs> by everyone. <laughs> <laughs> They've now taken him on board. But uh, yeah, so that, that was how, that's how the name came about, Kill O'Scully. We love, you know, and it was a beautiful place, part of Tipperary to shoot in Kill O'Scully up in Silver Mines. And Balna Hinch, all around that area. Oh, beautiful. Stunning uh, scenery and everything. So, and it was one thing we always thought when we were shooting and looking for a location for Killing Scully was that it, it's very much kind of a New York thing um, where they say, you know, for production value, if you've got amazing scenery, use it. And it's right. Yeah, it's yeah, cheap. yeah. It's there. It's all around you. And you're in a sense, it's cheap. New York, you have to pay for it now. But yeah, so yeah. We, we were in a beautiful place like uh, Silver Mines, uh, what you call Hill there. Uh, Keeper Hill and all that, so we're able to use the woods, the scenery, beautiful shots from up in the hills. It's just gorgeous part of the world, you know. So uh, we were we we're blessed with that, and it was great fun. I loved making it. it like it, it was a great show. I'm very very proud of it. It's getting a huge run out again now, and, and a, a huge amount of more fans even com- coming to it. Like we had, we've had huge viewership with it down through the years. But it's a pre watershed program. I mean, yeah. Uh, it's it's designed for families and kids and everything else like that. And it's great fun. It's really Yeah. Great. I like the way it treaded the perfect line of not being 
too slapstick, but there was definite deep comedy in it too. Like, you know what I mean? There was deep, deep yeah. comedy. Like, you know, you yeah, use... Look, there, is an, the, the, there is an elements of slapstick in it and clowning, as I'd call it, because mm. that's kind of the background of where I come from. Uh, I played multi-characters, for example, in it. I played five characters. I never, does, I never actually set out to do that. That was by accident. I played uh, one or two characters and in the pilot, a few actors that we had booked never turned up and we couldn't get them in. So I ended up jumping into costume for one or two characters <laughs> literally <laughs> at the last minute. And Goretti came about from a camera. Oh, oh yes, Goretti. I People love that character. I, I really love it. Because I had to get into women's clothing all every <laughs> It was a huge makeup. But I literally, does it, one thing we're known for now is power walking. You know, so we we, we, oh. had a, we had a transition shot outside the pub, moving from one place to another, and I said, "Look, just get, look, yo, why don't we just do a set of co workers and follow us through as a comic kind of transition team uh, with the director?" So we literally grabbed two women in the extras, and I got them into leisure suits and myself, and I just walked past Dieter going, "Yoo-hoo, or something like that." <laughs> And it was just to be a transition shot. And he loved it. And they said, look, we'd really love to have that character in more. So that, that's how Gretchen came about. And uh, it, it, still, a- it still cracks me up. Just her. <laughs> yeah. Because you know her. You know her. Like, you know. <laughs> you do. You do. And, and the thing is, like, I, to get my voice going, I just all started going, Ooh! <laughs> It was kind of, I'd start nearly every line like that to get me in. You know, so I was, oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, there's some funny stuff with her. There's no question of it, but it was physically painful. I uh, imagine Gretty was a fine bit of stuff back in her day. You know, I that kind t- of way, like, she- <laughs> she'd put manners on you. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that the thing? There's no, yeah, I know, yeah, there's a. I do. I, I Gretty, the great. She's 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 actually passed away in a uh, misfortune, but she yeah. came out of line one time and embarrassed the life out of me. I was only I was only eighteen. I was back from college for a weekend, and the, the father and mother said, "Should we meet you up at Detached?" There was a Detached bar yeah. at the time in, up near us, and I said, "Sure, we'll meet you for a drink." And I went in, and she comes over and she'd had a few, and she would, <laughs> she's now fag hanging out of the corner of her mouth. She's, and she starts grinding, squeezing my shoulders, chatting over my head, and I so I don't know what to do. I'm eighteen. I, I says, oh, how, how, how are you, Mary? She says, oh, shall I tell you one thing now? And you have to grow into a fine looking boy. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, and just, the father jokingly says, she goes, just as if I was only 20 years younger. I'm going, oh, Lord. And the, the, the father thinking he was gassy, he went, oh, hi, the two of you now. If you're doing a, like, stepping out, you're to, he's not ready to be, a, I'm not ready to be a grandfather just yet kind of a thing. And I'm dying. And, she, oh. and Pat, the phrase, and I need to put in a T-shirt, but only a handful of people understand. She turns around and winks at my owl And a mid-50s woman went, I wouldn't worry about that, pet. Or, Bill, you can't weld cowled iron. In other words, <laughs> <laughs> you can't weld cowled iron. Oh, I... That's brilliant. To, to this day, if I even just start the words cowled iron to the owl he's gone for 20 <laughs> minutes. He's gone. But I love those phrases. There was a guy up the road from us and he was... The boys, you know, young fellas in the street be always slagging. Some yeah, color. I won't mention the name because he could be still there. <laughs> but let's say this Jerry, and I'm like, Jerry, you whore. <laughs> as quick as that, he turns around and says, If I was a whore, you'd be the first ones up with your shillings. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly fell off the wall laughing and off with him like a shot. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Brilliant. Just Brilliant. A shot out the back door there. I yeah. love that stuff. Like, and not. Do you know, did, like, re- not realising we're going to carry that and log that for 20 years yeah. later, going, that yeah, yeah, yeah. is a moment of beauty, like, yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. I wouldn't be forgiven if I didn't mention, too, the, the, the mother, she still, well, she was in, she was at one of your shows years ago, and you were talking about a, sacri- a Eucharistic minister called Mary Mahoney that was peeking her, her nose up, and, uh, up at the altar. And, of course, the whole bunch of crew were in there with the mother, and she t- and Mary Mahoney being her name, and what was she stop. at the time? Only a Eucharistic minister. Oh, but, stop! But she, she uh, secretly she was loving it, like you know what I mean. Know. Like, but <clears throat> to the, the rest, to in UCH, but they were way up the back, of course. Thank the God, because you no doubt you would have been up to her going, <laughs> "There you are, Mary." <laughs> well, that that happens, you know, because you just use the name. And sure, how many Mary Mahoney's yeah. born? Oh. Alice Ryan, or yeah, know, <laughs> and and Dwyer, you know, whatever, yeah, and. and you you use a name and I used to be desperate for that when I'd be doing a show or writing a show I'd use names that I I remember 
as a kid. So Sister Bonaventure, something like that. <laughs> yeah. you know, I remember I remember there was this thing with Sister Bonaventure I had and sure Sister Bonaventure taught me in school, you know, as a kid. Right. So I was the only I was trying to look for a name of a nun that would be you know, like Sister Consider. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah Bonaventure yeah. came. I thought that's a great name. That's a Jesus, about six months later, I was doing the show on Turnless, and I went, Sister Bonaventure, the whole audience, oh, and I went, oh. <laughs> Cut right. They know her. Of course they know her. And I get, the sketch had nothing to do with her. Not yeah. Nothing to do with her. She was long dead. <clears throat> but the whole town remembered her. as, as the, She must have been the head nun in the convent, a lovely lady, you know. But whatever, I had heard the story of Sister Bonaventure <laughs> looking for Mickeys or something. <laughs> <laughs> It was all wrong anyway. Tom, I can tell you that. <laughs> I know. I, yeah, I did something similar, but I was, it was, I combined like three characters and a bit I was doing about teachers. And it was a bit, it was fairly new and I was happy with it and it was flying. And it opened for Neil Delamere we, in a gig we did in Bancha, in the GA Hall in Bancha one night. And I totally, I, sh- I was too naive. And of course, and you, you, your, your material is written and you're focused on that. You don't think. Ah, <clears throat> and sure, 99% of the audience knew exactly who I was talking about. <laughs> And even I looked down at the father, and the father was the only fellow in the middle of the audience roaring, laughing, because he also <laughs> knew the scenario. Like he went, you, you have made some bollocks yourself now, and you've still got 20 minutes to go. <laughs> How is he going to get out of this one? <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, but it, yeah, I mean, that, that is the beauty of it, isn't it? Like that you yeah. just, you know, you got, you, got to, you got to own it in that moment and go, well. Go oh, plow on, plow on. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> just... <laughs> Rabbit in the headlands. But that must be glorious, though, do you know what I mean? When you to have created these characters, you said, right, this is the character, built costume, everything. And then you personally, it's all you. And then you walk out, say, just for, I know we've mentioned it about 45 times now, UCH, they'll be paying this podcast at this stage. But <laughs> you, know, you walk out to a full house and people are in it straight away with you. You know what I mean? That must be glorious. It's, it's great. I mean, I always, like, a lot of my shows, I had quite a lot of physical humour in it. And interaction with the audience so you you never know how that's going to work out you know I mean? right yeah 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 yeah. do it because you can't rehearse you haven't got an audience to rehearse with yeah i do remember the show i did about the funeral and uh i had a coffin with me and i used to bring six guys up on the stage or four guys <laughs> they had no idea what they were doing there and then I, I, I i was in the black suit the undertaker <laughs> organizing everything yeah. and eventually get lads over here over here I stand there and then I pull off the drape and there's a coffin there and they go oh Jesus <laughs> and, up in the and walk out like it was brilliant it, and it was amazing people's reaction to a coffin in a the theatre yeah. like oh you know it was like, yeah, it, yeah 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 like, I, I remember when we were doing Kill the Scully I used to have a hearse and I, I got it off a friend of mine who was an undertaker down the country. And I was <laughs> too old for him. So it was an old Granada hearse. There's nothing wrong with it. I often, I often went down drinking with a few lads. We'd pile into the hearse and suits. <laughs> I, pulled up, I pulled up in a garage one day up the road. It's a kind of yeah. a pub with a pump outside it. Coming up to the office and I was heading out to set. It used to be Jaxie's hearse in Gillis Gully. And uh, the woman had come out, the old one came out to fill the pump. And I was sorry, what like what I put that? <laughs> As if there was something sacred about the car, you know. <laughs> and I said, fill it up. <laughs> that was brilliant. Another time we went to look at a location in, in uh, we were doing a scene in the church and I, I happened to be driving the hearse back from the office. And I par- parked outside the church and went in. Yeah. We did the location directly. Looked at where we put the cameras up, and then I took off. And that evening, I went down for a pint. Someone, who's dead, lads? There was a hairstyle, <laughs> <laughs> and there's no account of it. Are they coming back tonight or is it tomorrow morning? And the whole village was talking about who had died. <laughs> I loved the notion, Pat Short driving around the country with the elbow out the window, eh? <laughs> <laughs> out of Grenada Scorpio. <laughs> I, tried, I tried to bring my wife out for dinner, and one night she nearly killed me. Oh, stop. <laughs> Me great crack. <laughs> I went, yeah, I looked for one. I remember a couple of years ago, I went through a mad period. I mean, wouldn't it be funny now to drive around the hearse around the place like we just fitted with you know, black out yeah. the windows, or whatever? But c- couldn't find one for a love no money. But the last, the last one, Pat Short had bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it away to a friend of mine up in Galway. Um, I had it for a few years, and the kids got sick of it around the back of the house. 
His <laughs> friends coming into play and his hours at the side. <laughs> But there's so many irreverent things you would do in such a situation, like you know. But that's that's the beauty of it is that man, you get you play with a hearse and a coffin and all the re- yeah. She break crack with it, like you know. I would. We I had to drive from New York to Boston with their coffin in the back of the car. We'd pull in. We had to rent a car big enough to drive up myself and the sound engineer. We finished a run in New York with the show, yeah. and we got a coffin over there and we held onto it for the tour. <laughs> <laughs> Stopping out for a coffee at the places of the hearse stick with the coffee sticking out the back of the car. Keeping a couple of sandwiches cold. It's great. That was funny. Well, I think what like Gretty still to this day, I, I do I love the what you still letting them out of school early. I I love that just little throwaway, beautiful yeah. little lines. Yeah. You're going, Oh, that's that is just lovely. But I do, like I don't know, did he make did he make it into one of your was it hay or how was things? It was Eugene. You did him. You were you brought him out on the yeah. late late. I thought he was a masterpiece. Like there was so many facets to you. Do you remember he had the dog shit in his pocket? Oh yes, yes. That's I. That I was thinking it was that character. Yes, he was a few drinks out of it. But a few yeah, drinks, the rest are in them. And uh, he was running the local theatre. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And he was. <laughs> <laughs> he was a great character. But it was actually right. He's tidy up the place. He's insistent. <laughs> This is the people uh, tidy up after themselves. That was a great, that was a great gag. The amount of people. I used to, I used to I bar a Twix in the dog poo bag. Yeah. And I, used to, I used to softly melt it on a radiator before every show. Beautiful. <laughs> it was just a little bit smudgy. <laughs> Start to Pat's writer. Could you have a slightly warm red in the room, please? I need yeah. to melt my Twix. <laughs> and a half a Twix. <laughs> and he used to, yeah, jeez, I used to pull it out of the, every night. Oh, my God. Um, the amount of people I used to go crazy because they thought I was giving them real shit. <laughs> <laughs> what would you be thinking, you know? Where did I even go looking for it beforehand? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring a dog with me. Little Jack Russell there and feed him up. Which is like the, the breed, like your man on that, on, on the, the, the night at the late late, he was great for it. Like, and you could see him, like, he was, he was allowing it to, but you could see somebody clamming up, like going, oh my God, this is all too much for me in the moment. The, the actual, you know, there are characters stepping out of the tent yeah. on top of me here, like. Oh, yeah, I, I love that Late Late Show appearance. That's one of my favourite, actually, because I, uh, yeah, I was thinking the character's a bit drunk. So I thought, how do I do? So I asked the makeup artist, but you give me a big black smudge across the face. <laughs> so he looked like he was after falling into a ditch. Yeah. <laughs> That's what made it perfect, is that he looked like the owl, they call him in rugby, Alicadoos. You know, he knows too much. He fucking blazer on and there's all... He's skipping around the room like he knows the whole place. And obviously because, you know, he was of the theatre, there was a touch of campness to him. So he's nice and quick around the place. I yeah. just, I thought he was, I just thought he was a masterpiece. I'm going, I know 40 whores like that for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And with the, with the, the crest on the blazer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Probably the old crest too. It's probably been upgraded since the 2000s, but he still has the old jacket. Do you know what I mean? The blazer be shiny. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> been ironed. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get tell me this? Did you get most uh, you you much guff because you have never? Sometimes you find fellas that a certain amount of fame. They you never know where they're even from. Do you know there's no identity to them? Like, but there's no mistake in where Pat Short has ever been from. You you know you've always kind of backed the whole Tipperary thing and and even down to making sketches about ripping the absolute piss out of Kilkenny. Like you know, like. <laughs> Funny enough, I was up doing some work in the studio in Dublin this weekend. The guy, the sound engineer, Kilkenny, and he loved the Jersey one. You know the one I'm talking about with the Skoda, with the dogs. Well, he oh, liked the yeah. Skoda with the dogs. I got, <laughs> 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 I got an awful doing over that one, but it's a bit of crack. Like that's oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, for people that wouldn't remember or seen it, it's the one I where I picked up a dog shit with a Kilkenny jersey. Sure, I didn't pick up a shit. I didn't pick up anything. I just I went through the actions of it. It uh, wasn't a warm Twix by any chance, was it? Just, uh... <laughs> what, I'd love if people saw it. I got a huge response, a very funny response from a lot of Kikini people. And there was one woman sent me uh, where she was sitting on the toilet and the toilet paper, <laughs> the toilet paper was Tipperary Bunton. <laughs> I thought that was a That is brilliant. Paper. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Classic, classic one. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes, yeah, you you know, people sometimes step outside the world and they forget. Oh wait, it's Pat Short, the comedian. Do you know? Yeah, yeah. It's they can fun. they can take take. But there must have been, I'd say, probably the most 
used, I'm not, I suppose, used, but the most frequent uh, uh, costume every single Halloween that I've ever been out or ever been at anything is somebody you've played, typically. It's normally, it's the hand, like they go, well, everybody knows. And it's quite often it's Tom from Father Tate. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. What yeah. was the direction on Tom from Father Tate? Or was it just, Pat, we're going to leave this to you here? <laughs> it's I, kind of a bit of that. Um, I auditioned for it and I remember doing the audition and they all roll around laughing, Arthur and Graham and uh, the director and everybody. And, and uh, they just gave me the job. And they said, yeah, that's the, the voice, everything you had is spot on. So was that kind of mad. And I, what it was, was I was working with a director from Monaghan at the time. And he said, I love the Monaghan accent. It's great. Really very, very funny and smart. And funny people up there. And I loved his accent. And I gave it with a bit of Tipperary and a bit of roughness. And I kind of mixed it all up. And it, it came across like this mad, you know, how are you had <laughs> You leave me all down to that tree. You know what I mean? It kind of came out like that. And they loved it. And then they just like shaved the head and cut him up and made him look like a lunatic. Uh, and the I shot JR t-shirt <laughs> is iconic. You know, I mean, I, I did a tour of Australia. And every city I was in, Melbourne, Sydney, everywhere, I had to do radio shows you know promotion for the show and stuff like that and every one of them presented me with a nice shot jr t-shirt i had about 10 of them coming back from australia oh thanks lads thanks another, another one. <laughs> and everyone asked me like well, had i got did i ever get to hang on to it and you know was, father ted wasn't huge when i did it yeah first year was very small and then we did series two and it caught on after series two in a big way yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wasn't in series three. I didn't make that at all, or the Christmas special. I just did, I think it was three episodes of one and three episodes of two. Um, so d- d- it, I never experienced the kind of manicness of it. Do you know what I mean? Why yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it didn't really catch on until afterwards. It's funny you talk about that accent. You just reminded me of a thing I was doing uh, with an events company. They do these Oscars, they call it, for, with GA clubs. Do you know, oh, yeah. they, yes. they make sh- shortened versions of Kevin Rowe and shortened versions of movies. And they'd wanted to do, um, they wanted to do uh, Man About Dog. And it's a 10 minute oh, version, yeah. you know. And I said, Grant, I'll, I'll just make a short script feat, no bother at all. And this is above in Cavan. And it got the lad that, they, that had been picked to play you. He was gr- brilliant. And he was reading the script and he went, hey, oh, I can't. I can't do your accent because he sounds like you. Can you, do, can you tell me how it sound Tipperary? I went, you don't need to sound temporary, man. You're already go on. Do do the line. Do the line. He went. I don't know. I think it's. I think it's funny. You're in your accent. I'm going. Jesus Christ, man! Just say the line. And Jim, he, he turns around and goes. Just them boys, them balls, and them like Bengali tigers. And I. That was it for me for the rest of that. Because I can't even look at you. That don't you do not your accent. You just nailed it. You don't realize how funny we find your accent. To be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> how are you holding for time pat i don't want to hold you up either i know you'll be you have to go on um i know i've about 10 minutes left because i um, have another project to, to, to do the i have a researcher to talk to there on, on ray darcy i'm doing uh i'm on talking on actually i'm on with amy hoopman on friday My talking team. to ray darcy uh we i'm in the last episode of finding joy so, uh, talking about that, but it's so long ago, I can't remember what it's about. <laughs> I'm hoping someone will tell me. You'll just be making up bits. Well, there was this time. Uh... Yeah. It was so, joy. I never forget the same day was joy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the I, best I can do. Yeah, but I had a blue shirt on. Uh, there was a... Uh, yeah. but, <laughs> but you, you like you said, oh, the time of the Tony Awards and all the rest of it, like that, you know, there must be kind of pinch yourselves moment. But there's... I, it was only, it popped up, I don't know, it was a relatively recent or whatever, but I only caught, caught a glimpse of it that you, were you asked to play Jumbo Breakfast Road for, for Prince Albert? Yeah. <laughs> I was mentioned, yes. Yes and no. What happened was, <clears throat> we, um, I, I won an award at the Monaco uh, Film Festival. Yeah. And uh, I, I, you see, the film awards there is different than what we'd be used to. You know, we'd be used to the Academy Awards, if the awards, you go up and thank your mother and your father <laughs> and your agent and all the rest, right? Whereas they have more of a Las Vegas type Monte Carlo with the casinos there. Yeah. So it's a big, huge show. Like the, the host and hostess came on in a big open top uh, car, huge stage <laughs> and massive, massive theater. And they had a full orchestra on the stage as well. 
and the different sets and dancers came out and did routine. You know, it's, it was like a big Las Vegas show. The road to Trinity. So, <laughs> the, <yeah. laughs> so when it came to me, uh, when they were up by Cam, and of course they got, they asked actors to sing songs that they'd sung, and they orchestra backed them. And they heard about the breakfast roll. And they asked me, would I sing the breakfast roll in orchestra? And I was going, no. No. <laughs> Go on, sing. They obviously had ready prepared and everything. I fucking not. I, no, fuck no. I'm not singing the fucking rhyme. <laughs> so I would, I'd like to thank me, agent. I'd like to thank me, man. <laughs> My Harlan coach under 12s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when the, when we finished, when the awards only finished, at the very end, they asked all the recipients of the awards to come up on stage for a photo. <sighs> and Pr- Prince Albert, I was after receiving an award for his mother, a pr- pr- posthumous award for Grace Kelly. Yes, and uh, see, he was on the stage, and he, he beckoned for me to come over to take him over. I stood beside him, and he was like, and I think it was the Irish Connection, and all the rest. He was chatting away to me. And he says, "What song? We? Why didn't you sing the song?" I said, ah, "I don't know. I didn't. It's, I, I wasn't in the mood for singing." It's about sandwiches. sandwiches. Trophy told us about sandwiches. Sausages, rashers, and builders. And I said, "All right." And he said, "Sure, look, would you sing it? So you sing it for me at the table later on at the dinner." I said, "Well, of course. Oh, geez, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll be, I'll be singing it over." Yeah. So like. Monte Carlo, I don't know if anyone ever been there. It's all French and, and Italian. It's the main language. And I, we had, I had a, I had an interpreter assigned to me, but he, he went missing. I couldn't find him. <laughs> that was and we were supposed to go to this dinner down at the in, you know, afterwards, a big banquet. And I'd been travelling since six in the morning. Uh, I, up from Cork to, I was in Cork and I found I found out I got the award. And they, I had to get lyric. We got my wife down to Dublin to get a flight out, get the kids sorted in. in uh, with their mothers, grandmothers, and then land in, in Marseille and then go travel across. You know, we're traveling all day. Then I had to do a big press call because I'd won the big award of the night, the best actor. So I had to jump into Tuxedo, get down to the theater early and then do a load of photographs. I actually fell asleep in the theater. Uh, we were brought in on my own. And I got this nudge from my wife as a camera was moving along, <laughs> tracing along in front of me. Was all yep, yep. television. And I, suddenly there's thousands of people in the theater. I was like, Jesus Christ, what happened? <laughs> I'd been so I was really disorientated, and so when the wars was over, I said, "Look here, I really don't want to go to a dinner, a big banquet dinner." Yeah. I said, "Will we just grab a bottle of champagne, head back to the room, put the order, throw the shoes off, order some food up to the room, and relax?" We're flying out the next day, so Karen said, "Yeah, we do that." So we got we got a car to bring us back. We had a limousine lined up, and they wouldn't, they didn't think we were supposed to have it. (laughs) We had to get a taxi. (laughs) Because <laughs> because they thought like, but you're just the dinner is still on and everything. I was there with the award. Said no, I got the award. I want to go home I'm back to the hotel. So I saw here taxi jumped in his back to the hotel. I was in the hotel about ten minutes in the room, and the phone rang and it was the interpreter guy. And he said, uh, we, "Prince Albert is looking for you at the table." Oh Jesus! <laughs> and I said, "You know, <laughs> I don't know." It's, 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 I, another another time I catch up with him again. <laughs> Would you believe I was out the following year? I was nominated for the television awards, and he was at the dinner, and I was hiding from him all night. <laughs> I don't think he'd remember me, but I didn't want to go sing it. <laughs> he was at the table only up for me. Oh God! Isn't that isn't that gas? Like how we can't like that song made perfect sense to the entire island of Ireland, but as yeah. soon as you go anywhere, you go. I I I just couldn't. I'd have to explain every and the yeah, nuances. It, it was very much of the time. Oh. Uh, which which most pop songs or any song is, and I, it was a comedy tune. But I wrote that song for a character in a show. I didn't write that as a single. Was that uh, Dixie's? Yeah, and yeah. I, I he was a builder in the show, the, the character, and I like I knew lots of builders. <clears throat> I knew lots of fellas that play music at nighttime in pubs, but they're a builder during the day. You know, mm. loads of them. The, and of course, that time with the boom on. Loads of guys doing that. I was building and, myself at the time doing comedy yeah. at night, like and going. There you this go. Is, this is our yeah. thing. And yeah, the fact, that's the fact that you drop in emo as a petrol station. Okay. You, could, <laughs> you couldn't have been more niche to drop in yeah, an yeah. emo. Like, <laughs> I, I like it was written for the show, and I did it on the late late show as a promotion. You know, for the show, not not for any other reason, but it just literally took off. And uh, Ruth Scott, the two FM DJ, yeah. she was the one that championed it the next day. And it just went, it was pre, pre-internet going viral. It went viral, if you know what I mean. So we, Sony contacted me. I used to do, I was a Sony artist at the time. And they contacted me and says, look, we need to get this done. We need to get this out. They're looking for the radio stations, and everything else. So we lit, we, to get something turned around that quick was nearly impossible. So we got it done in Germany and uh, got it printed and 
back in the shops in Ireland and it, it was the biggest selling single of all time in Ireland. <laughs> isn't that gorgeous? Isn't it? Mad, you, yeah. No intentions of making it. Like <clears throat> brilliant. Because I I was in I, I sang it in Vegas at a karaoke. Go away. I like some bollocks. I mean I did not that I give a shite, but what was hilarious if you stood back and looked at the scenario, I didn't realise the same bar was playing whoever was singing out on the street. They were playing it out onto the street. <laughs> Celine Dion was in the wind across the way. Garth Brooks was next door in the Bellagio. Johnny and what's her name were next door again. And this is this who are singing about rashers. <laughs> and a couple, of, it just drew, it was like the calling card to every Irish person in within a hundred yards. We're like, oh, chill, we better go look. And people wandering in, I'm steaming, of course, like full, <laughs> full of warm cider, like just looking down the Brilliant. I was, I was asked to sing it in, in uh, I was on a radio show in A Man. In Jordan, brilliant, and brilliant. Bring it down there, and I was like, "No, I don't <laughs> with the tournament." Day. I you love know? that. I said, "Let us." It's all about pork products. <laughs> <laughs> Straight away, that's it. That's fine. No problem. Moving on. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the tea is about the only thing in this I can mention. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Pat, short. I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you very, very much for being on. This has been glorious. Tom's when, been when, yeah, I know it's fucking. Will at some stage I'll come. I I think you owe me the price of two tickets, by the way. Oh, um, we'll, we can organize that when things open up again. Only <laughs> only because <laughs> one one of the times in UCH, I was my my tip accent must have come on so strong. While a uh, while in the panto, two women come out and went. Jesse it sounds very like Pat Sharp, doesn't he? We'll get you. And there was huge Pat Sharp poster in the perfect place, right beside the ticket counter. <laughs> It's like, we'll get two to him. And they came down and said it to me because you sounded so like Pat Short during that show that two women came out and bought two tickets. I went, right, oh, well, I'll say it to Pat the next time I see him. So, <laughs> Hey, Tom, it was lovely talking to you. Thank Great. you very, very much, Pat. Thank you. Mind yourself. Good luck. Good luck. Mind yourself. And my thanks again to Pat. My God, what an absolute legend. Some crack, isn't he? Huh? Some crack. Imagine a few pints with that man. Oh, Lord, save us and guard us. What a legend. His new show will be back on on tour at some stage. You know the crack. You're not going to be disappointed if you go to one of his shows. So, like I said before, if you want to support the podcast, go ahead. Look down the show notes for the Patreon page. Little as three doll hairs a month. You'll get to see the full footage of that. You'll get to see all the video footage of all the other interviews that I've done. And you support the podcast. You throw a couple of doll hairs at it. As soon as lockdown drops, we're getting some new gear. Big old screen. The whole lot. If you got some merch, tag me. Tom O'Mahony in, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Chatty Snaps is, t- I don't know what it even is anymore. I've completely forgotten. Same with the old Twitter. You know yourself. Lads, there you have it. Leave me a note. Leave me a five-star review. And no, less than that, no good to a man. No good to any man. Share it with your friends. Slip it into their pocket when they're not looking. Now, go on away. Boys and girls, enjoy the rest of the weekend. I'll talk to you again next week. Good luck, bye, and God bless, and thanks.